1987, which deals with child custody, shared child custody, and it establishes a presumption. If you could. Right. Uh, I have a constituent of mine, David Scalmero, who is here. He's been here all day, and uh, he would like to come up and address exactly what his problem is. Come right forward, Mr. Scalmero, and explain to us uh, what the, what's being proposed. Well, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak for you folks. Uh, my name is David Scalmero. I'm a father. Um, somebody asked me if I, whether I represent myself or an organization. The answer is really kind of both. Uh, most of my little presentation will be as a representative for a group of Virginia Equal Parents. But at the end, I can't resist to add a little of my How many own children do you have, Mr. Stone? I have two children. And how old are they? They're about 13 and 11. And um, as I said, most of my remarks will be as a representative of Virginia Equal Parents. But some of my remarks, I I'll probably give you my own personal opinions. I hope you'll go right ahead. That's, that's um, what we're here for. We want to hear from people. That... We're a statewide organization, and uh, we think children need a mommy and a daddy. Uh, research indicates that children have lower incidence of drug abuse, teen pregnancy, poor educational performance, and criminal behavior when they have meaningful relationships with both parents. We have a little saying in our group. One father sticking his hand out by saying, give me those car keys. You're grounded tonight for not doing your homework. It's worth, excuse me, worth 10 social workers. Divorce is awfully difficult, uh, especially for the children. I've never seen anything like it, really. Uh, uh, we think by smoothing the way towards sound custody agreements, House Bill 1787 will offer help in the vast majority of the cases. And I think the lady from the Supreme Court said something about 128,000, which is, would fill up the football stadium a couple times. This is kind of shocking to me. But, but we're talking about the vast majority of the cases. Two fit parents. Advocates point out that the current practice in Virginia, in which the mother is presumed custodial parent, encourages the conflict. This shared parenting bill would require that courts handling separation and divorce agreements work from the presumption that both parents should share, and the word is share, equal, uh, physical and legal custody. This will encourage cooperation and keeps the focus on what is best for children. Instead of a father having to fight for time with the children he loves, the legal system would presume that he merits equal time and spend its time working out the details and practicalities of a given case. Shared parenting is not a rigid 50-50 split. The mere presumption that both parents deserve ample time eases the tensions and the eventual agreement is arrived at depends on many, many factors. There was a time when it was generally reasonable for the mother to be awarded custody of the children, almost automatically. That time is there was also a time when women did not have the right to vote because of their gender. Just because that's the way it was always been done, we don't think it, it means it's the right thing to do. Uh, family dynamics and gender roles have changed. Just as women have proved themselves in the workplace, men have come into their own as nurturers at home, often very closely involved in their children's upbringing. The bill, it must be emphasized, is for families in which both parents are fit and no other problem gets in the way, such as parents living far apart. Judges would depart from the shared parenting starting point whenever the best children of the, whenever the best interests of the child so dictated, and this is, we think is a very important part of it, with written reasons. The bill offers an enormous and welcome change in how families would navigate marriage dissolution. Once this sad private decision had been made, the system would help the parents find the way forward that puts the children on the best possible footing. Afterward, other benefits would accrue. Children doing better in school, paternal grandparents enjoying access, less fighting, and better child support compliance. This bill offers respect and assistance to both partners who are parting ways, freeing up time and attention for the young ones affected who want and need both parents. 
Uh, as I mentioned, 120, I think the lady said 128,000 children in Virginia in 2009. Millions across the country are caught in, every year are caught in a tug of war in high conflict custody cases. You mentioned earlier about our adversarial justice system working. We think it's more effective in criminal and other civil matters, but our adversarial system pits mothers against fathers and we think it further damages children. It really becomes a, a battle among expert opinions, psychologists, guardian ad litems, with whom their opinions carry great weight with the judge. Their opinions over which person has more capability as a parent. We have some question that do these experts have codes of conduct, professional standards, continuing education, peer review? Do these experts have discretion in determining what information to gloss over or assign weights of importance or disregard completely? Do these experts mitigate the risk that bias and prejudice will adversely affect their conclusions? Are experts that overwhelmingly rule in favor of mother's capabilities over father's guilty of bias and prejudice? Can two experts viewing the exact same data set on a family provide two very different recommendations? And this is where the part I think I get into my personal feelings. I, I don't mean any disrespect, honestly. I don't. Um, with all due respect to this committee, judges, guardians, psychologists, and attorneys, in my experience, we, I think the Juvenile Domestic Relations Court proceedings take on the dynamics of an American Idol contest. Each parent auditions, performs a home assessment, and the judge's decisions decides after consideration of these experts' opinions who is privileged enough to carry home the title and the children. Some other people have said 90% of the time the mother gets the prize. And the father is relegated to a visitor. And this is the part I've been told not to say, but I can't resist. It takes on the dynamics of a witch hunt in which the father is demonized and is declared a warlock. I played sports at Norview High School in Norfolk alongside Coach Data. He played football, I played basketball. I would add, he was a great sponsor of this bill, and I would just ask, who would participate in any event in which the statistical outcome was so overwhelmingly against them. Is there any way to wonder why fathers give up? How can we keep fathers in the game? Wouldn't passing this bill be a start? I think there are a couple other folks who would like to speak sure, for the bill. Forward. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tony Floor, and I operate a group called Virginia Families Association. Uh, most Virginia citizens recognize the importance of a cohesive family structure. This cohesiveness is first and foremost the needs of children. When the family becomes fractured, it is still possible to have some sense of cohesion. Studies and reports on the importance of fathers abound. The information is not disputed. The Missouri Supreme Gender Bias Task Force found that children without fathers have or are 72% 70, more likely to have a teenage pregnancy, 86% more likely to become a psychotic delinquent, 300% more likely to become involved with gang activity, 200% increase in attempted and successful teen suicide, 200% increase in the likelihood that the child will require a psychological treatment. According to the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry, 40% of mothers reported that they had interfered with fathers' visitations to punish their ex-spouses. 50% of mothers see no value in the father's continued contact with his children. And according to the Center of Disease Control, 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. And according to the Criminal Justice and Behavior, 80% of rapists motivated with displacement anger came from fatherless homes. According to the National Principals Association, 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. According to the Department of Justice, 70% of juveniles in state-operated state institutions come from fatherless homes. Fulton County Jail population reports that 85% of all youth sitting in prisons grew up in fatherless homes. According to the U.S. Bureau of Census, there are 11,268,000 total custodial mothers. There's only 2,907 
custodial fathers. 2,900,000, excuse me. I come before you today to ask you to make a decision to support this House Bill 1787. In this bill, we are asking you to set the stage and level the playing field. The tender year laws which push the courts to give custody to the mothers are no longer around, but the ideology still exists in our courts. I have heard arguments that laws are written to protect our rights to parent our children, but on a personal level, both as a child that was raised in a divorce situation and fought the courts to, to live with my dad, and as a father who's fighting for my rights to parent my child, I've experienced this type of ideology. In the best interest of the child, number one is the age of the child, which my circuit court judge used against me as his sole reason to grant my son's mother physical custody. The nine other were not even addressed by the judge, even though the evidence showed and touched on all ten points. But with the age of the child, it gives the judicial system the ability to still push those tender year laws. This bill gives us the ability to feel as though we have a level playing field and a light at the end of the tunnel. We're not asking that you throw out the rules of evidence or the best interests of the child, only to hear our children's cries as they try to make sense of all of this, as they fight to feel the love from both parents equally. This bill gives them back something they need, and that's a mommy and a daddy. Honorable delegates, you have a unique decision today to cast down your vote yes for House Bill 1787. I ask that you cast down your vote for our children. Cast it down for the future. Cast it down for their need of security and love for both parents. Cast it down so they too can live in a relationship. When, more, when one parent is not made a visitor in, the lives, in their lives and they get the both, best of both worlds, good solid virtues for <coughs> both parents. Cast it down so children are no longer the product of divorce, but are thriving, growing, healthy children that fill the love of both parents through the divorce. They are our future leaders, or they are our future problems. The decision is yours. Vote yes for this bill and make a change in the way our society views the non-custodial parent. We are more than just visitors. We are parents. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other one there? I have one more. Come right forward. I think the other side has some way. I'm sure. Yeah, sure. Come sure. right forward. What you do? Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Uh, my name is Kenneth Skilling. I'm a resident of Fairfax County, Virginia, and uh, I want to uh, endorse uh, the case for this uh, bill for uh, joint custody. Uh, I should say on a personal note that uh, my children, my son and daughter, are in their mid-30s now, so I have no, nothing personal at stake in the outcome of this uh, bill. Uh, I would very much support what previous speakers have said, and I would just want to add a few additional points. Uh, one is that uh, uh, those of us who support joint custody are well aware of the fact that it's, it has its problems. Uh, but I would ask you to bear in mind that the current system, uh, which really overwhelmingly consists of uh, uh, sole maternal custody, the current system has very serious problems. Some of the problems were referred to by earlier speakers, the, the whole situation in regard to the growth of crime that results from fatherless families, fall, falling educational standards, uh, even the fact that divorce itself is hereditary. Uh, but um, so when you're when you're thinking about this bill as an alternative to the current situation, please do not ignore the fact that the current situation is very far from being an ideal one. The other point that I'd like to make to you is what happens as a result of the current custody situation. Uh, and some people have mentioned the. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the current situation encourages conflict between the parents. But one of the other things that it does is that it has resulted in a child support enforcement system and other elements of the current situation that are heavily biased against fathers uh, because the custody disparity is so great. And by the way, I should mention that uh, the last study that I know of that said how many <coughs> fathers were custodial parents 
was one done by the JLARC organization, and they said that only 4% of fathers in Virginia were custodial parents. So what that leads up to is that you have a whole system of child support enforcement which is heavily biased against fathers. Now, if we had joint custody in Virginia, we'd get away from all that. We'd get away from conflict in divorce, and we'd get away from conflict that results from this known bias against fathers. So I would very much urge you to support this bill. Any other Do you all, all have any questions on uh, <laughs> any of the speakers? Any, any other no, I, I, I think any other witnesses in favor of the bill? I think, I think that was it. There were three. I think there's somebody opposed, but I, I, I think the statistics ought to speak for themselves, so you know, I'll leave it at that. But there are, there are other speakers. All right. Uh, any, anybody who's opposed, please come forward and tell us who you are. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Richard Gary. I'm actually here wearing three hats this afternoon. First and foremost, I'm here as both a custodial and non-custodial father. My ex-wife and I have split custody of our three children. Uh, secondly, I'm here representing the Virginia Family Law Coalition, and thirdly, I am here representing the Virginia Commission on the Needs of Children. Uh, I am opposed to this personally, as well as both organizations that I'm here representing are both opposed to the bill. It's a bad bill. Um, statistics show, in my own personal practice, practice and practitioners across the state will tell you the highest conflict situations and the highest conflict trouble for children come about when you have a shared custody arrangement in which the mother and the father don't get along. The only time shared custody, week on, week off, whatever the arrangement may be, that's beneficial for the children are actually in situations where for whatever reason the mother and the father are able to get on board about all of the major decisions <coughs> for the children. It also only works in situations where the mother and the father live in the same school district, where they're close enough to get the children to school on time, to get them to their events, to allow them to participate in normal activities that they would otherwise. In situations of high conflict, which is many times when you have divorcing couples, but also in situations that you have many times in JDR where mom and dad really didn't have a relationship. Mom and dad met at a bar one night, and they had an encounter, and they have a child. To come in and stranglehold that judge to say the initial burden is going to be proved to the court that equal time between mom and dad is what shouldn't happen. Shifts a burden away from the initial and the only determination the court should make, which is under law. There's no tender years doctrine. It hasn't been around for as long as I've been around as an attorney. I doubt if it's been around Pretty much uh, most of Mr. Barlow's career, I think, the tender years doctrine has, uh, has, has gone away. And I've known Delegate, I've worked with Delegate Barlow for a while, so I think I can get away with that. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the only consideration the court should make is what is in the best interest of the child. In the 15 years I've acted as a guardian ad litem, every time I meet with mom, every time I meet with dad, the first thing I tell mom and dad is, I don't care about you. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care what your agenda is. The only thing I care about is your child. And I'm going to make a recommendation that is what I think is in the best interest of your child. And I would tell you that my experience, at least with the guardian, guardians in Lytham and Hampton Roads, and the guardians in Lytham I have met across the state in my dealings with the Virginia State Bar Board of Governors and with the Virginia Bar Association, the majority of those GALs feel the same way I do. They take their job seriously, and they are here looking out for the best interests of children. To enact this statute moves us, takes us one step away from the only consideration any court should have, and that is what is in the best interest of the children. Thank you. Uh, question, Delegate Johnson. Sir, the uh, on line 27 and 28, 
absent evidence that demonstrated that such a reward is not in the best interest of the child. All the judge needs to do is say it's not in the best interest of the child. He's going to do what he wants to do. So really, this judge wouldn't do anything, would he? I would say, on the face of it, perhaps, Delegate Johnson. I think when you start peeling back the onion a little bit, it does shift the burden of proof to having to prove that a certain arrangement should not automatically, by fiat, take place. Currently, when you walk into court on any custody issue, the judge is at his tabula rasa. There is no scheme that the court is looking at. And the only thing the court considers is, are the ten, the ten factors. And, and to set a standard that now we have to move back and forth from, I think shifts that, shifts that importance away from the best interest of the child to the right of one parent over the other, or the rights of the parents. And quite you frankly, you, you don't disagree with, I think it was Daniel Patrick Moynihan who first said in 1966 that the, about the worst thing that can happen to a child in our society is to not have a father who's involved with his upbringing. I mean, I, I mean the outcomes for those children are compared to children with intact, you know, relationships. So you don't, you're not, you're not taking that addition. What you're saying is, as I understand it, is, is that you don't think that this bill is necessary because the best interests of the child are, should be the controlling issue here. But you would argue with some of the testimony that says that, that certainly the outcomes for children, I mean, we just had a meeting here, you know, in another committee I was in that, I mean, there's this unbelievable statistical information that says that parents born out, children born out of wedlock, children from divorced families, their outcomes are just horrendous in comparison on a statistical average with those children who come from intact families. You're not making that argument. You, so you don't disagree with all their argument, right? I, I do not. And yeah. In fact, as a father of four daughters, uh, three of which are, are from a, a previous marriage, um, I realize and I encourage the importance of active fathers in their children's lives. It is imperative. Yeah, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. First, let me just say, as a mother to a five-month-old, I, I couldn't do it without his father. I just, I couldn't. Um, so I don't disagree with anything you said on that. I guess my question would be, getting at the issue of when custody cases turn into a witch hunt, I don't see how this bill would change that because now you're just saying, rather than, the, rather, and tell me if you agree with this, because I've been practicing this area, but rather than the judge now looking at what is in the best interest of the child, when you set up this presumption, you were, from the get-go, giving the parents an incentive to go after each other more <coughs> viscer viscer viscerally than under the current standard. So I don't see how this bill fixes that problem. Could you, could you address that? Mr. Chairman, Delegate McClellan, I agree with you completely. I'll take it one step further. I think what this bill does is actually increase the potential of high conflict litigation. Uh, the State Bar has recently put out a new video called Spare the Child, where we are encouraging parents to sit down and work these things out before they even get into the courthouse. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes you have to turn it over to a third party to make these decisions. But when you have a standard that says, barring some evidence that it's not in the best interest of the child, you're going to have this arrangement. At that point, when you have a high conflict situation where they're not able to work it out, you're going to have mom and dad coming into court. You're going to have them pointing fingers at one another. And it is actually going to ramp up, I think, the enmity and the anger between the parties, which everyone knows feeds down to the children. In fact, studies have shown 
that it's not necessarily just children of divorced families who may or may not be less successful in life, but children of divorced families where the parents have continually gone back to court, have continually litigated custody and visitation issues, those are the children that have psychological problems in the future. I feel like I'm trying to talk myself out of a job here, but that, that is, is in fact what the purpose of the statistics are overwhelming. I mean, it's just since, since the, since the you know, I'll, I'll say this, since, since no-fault divorce became the norm, what's happened to the family in our society is going to be legal. Anyway, any further questions? Oh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Did you I, oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I just make a, a couple of comments. One, uh, or I guess I could direct a question to Mr. Gary. Um, the, the term is used, a presumption. Uh, I assume it's implied that this is a rebuttable presumption. It often would be a conclusive a presumption. Um, but it, it seems to me like, and, I, and, and I've certainly sympathized with it when the folks who have testified so far. Um, I, I feel very strongly that, if at all possible, both parents need to be very much involved in the raising of the children. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I must say, uh, we review the performance of judges on this committee. Uh, and certainly that's one thing that we uh, look at uh, and should look at probably more closely. Uh, are our judges uh, biased one way or the other in this particular area? Uh, and uh, I think we need to make sure that our judges uh, do uh, lean over backwards to try to involve both, both parents uh, in, in the raising of the children. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Doug, before I answer your question, I you know the coalition we looked at that, we did make the, the assumption that it was a rebuttable presumption. And I can only speak from my own professional experience. I've managed to lose as many cases for mothers as I have managed to lose for fathers. So, at least the judges I've seen in the toddler, I think, are um, doing a fairly good job overall. Any other questions for this witness? Right. Christy, you wanted to speak as well? Come right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Christy Mayer with the Virginia Poverty Law Center. I will be very brief. Just I will simply say that we also oppose the bill for all of the reasons that Mr. Gary had so eloquently and fully explained. Is there anyone else in opposition to the bill? All right, uh, Billy, Taylor, you have the last word before we yeah, I go. Uh, I think uh, the points that you brought up, you're saying the bill does not do anything? Is there an amendment that can fix it? Well, well no, I'm, I'm saying that I'm afraid the bill will make it worse because it, it, it automatically gives parents that already aren't getting along an incentive to tear each other down more than the current law does. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this, this has been a problem <coughs> over the past years. It's been a problem. So you know, this is an opportunity to maybe fix this problem by addressing it in some way. If this bill doesn't do it, if an amendment or something would do it, I'd appreciate your consideration of doing trying to fix it so that, you know, these fathers, uh, can participate in their children's work. <coughs> and, uh, if there's any way it can be done, you know, I'm amenable to any kind of amendment or anything we can do. Or at another time, I don't know. I mean, it's, but this, this is an issue that's not going to go away, and, and it just frustrates a number of, I don't know how many divorced parents there are in the country, but it frustrates about two thirds of them, I'm sure, you know, because of the custody issue. So this is a golden opportunity for this committee to be to the forefront of something that would make things equal and fair for fathers. That's all I have to say. Also, one last thing for I wanted to note that the 2007 Delegate Bell had a bill that is virtually identical to this particular bill. So I would agree with what Delegate Tata said. Obviously, uh, this is an issue that uh, that has been before us before and probably uh, will continue to be before us. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, okay. So what would be in order to resume like this video? Maybe the next time and maybe you have to kind of get together and see if they can work out something that might 
I'm asking whether or not it could be carried over so that you and others would be able to get on something that might be agreeable. I, I agree. Now, I've represented a lot of people in juvenile courts and over my 50 years of practice of law. Uh, I'd much rather go to court with a lady than I would a man because normally I just figured I was beat before I got to the courthouse if I represented the man. It's been a problem, it continues to be a problem, and I think if there's something that we can do that might solve this problem, that we should do it. I agree. Well, we uh, we operate here on a motion. Mr. Chairman, may one comment? Sure, Doug, it'll be. Um, I, I, I'm a a product of a, of a divorce situation, but um, and lucky I have two very involved parents. And I've got to be honest with you, because I'm sitting here, I don't know what the right answer is on this. Um, part of me says this bill doesn't do anything that isn't already the law. Um, part of me says that putting that presumption is, is significant. To me, it's a really, really, really close call as whether or not it does anything worth doing. And when that's the case, I think voting in favor of fairness and equality and putting everybody on the same footing makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm not sure what the consequences of this are, and I'm not sure if they're significant or insignificant, but I'm inclined to support the bill at this time for those reasons. Okay, well, once again, I'll get back to the original thing here. We operated this, this subcommittee by motion. Um, I, 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 I move to report the bill. Do we have a second to the I motion to report? Okay. We have a second on the motion to report the bill. All right. Okay. Is there a substitute? Uh, substitute yeah. motion? Not sure. Move to table. Second. All right. It's been a substitute motion to table the bill, uh, which is a non debatable, non -debatable motion. Um, all those in favor of tabling the bill, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Who is opposed? Looks like it's two no's, so it's table for this year. I do want to say, though, that I do agree with what Delegate Tatus said. I mean, I think this is an issue that we're going, maybe not in this context, but I think there have been a lot of attempts in different areas, including things like covenant marriage and an extended uh, period of <coughs> separation before you allow divorce in the case of children. This is something that's troubled me for a long time as well. And, uh, and, I, and I do think Virginia, as it always does, is moving slowly. Um, so that, that's not a very helpful thing to say to people who are uh, dealing with the uh, problems involving their own children. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add a comment to that, if I might. Sure. Uh, this this uh, committee has the um, governance of our judiciary. We uh, review and vet and certify people for the bench. And so I would say we should take that as to when we interview juvenile judges, if there's a bias, uh, if there's a way to ask questions in order to get at that issue and make it clear that we do not tolerate that, then we should do that. You know, with the committee's permission, you know, maybe, maybe the subcommittee chairman should write a letter to the Supreme Court asking that we, that we certainly review what type of training our judges are getting with respect to um, yeah. I think that would be a great idea, Mr. Chairman. Uh, does anybody have any objection to me uh, writing a letter to the Chief Justice and saying that th this is certainly an area that uh, we want to make sure our judiciary has adequate training uh, on the importance of both the father and the mother involved or something in this area? Chairman, I think, I think that's a good idea. And I also might say that if somebody has worked in this area for 25 years, uh, and somebody who's done a lot of work recently in, in, a, in a, an approach that's called collaborative divorce, where you put the parties together, they commit right at the beginning, they're not going to litigate, uh, partly for the best interests of the child. Uh, you, we've got to encourage more alternative dispute resolution without people going to court. And, and you know, whether it involves trying to figure out ways that parents can file parenting plans, uh, Colorado, Montana, and other states have these parenting plans that they have people file so that at least they get thinking about how's the best way we can work this out for the ch child. And that would be good. Uh, there may be some 
legislation in the, in the next session that I'd have to do with collaborative divorce and collaborative decision making that uh, maybe this uh, committee will have an opportunity to, to take a look at. And I think that might advance the ball and address some of the problems that people are talking about. They're quite reasonable concerns. I want to thank you for your time, and I appreciate your writing the letter. That would be great. No objection. I will address that letter to Lilia just just so we can be advised on what we're doing. And, you know, in this area. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Delegate. Sure.